David Foster Wallace is a former Bloomington, Illinois resident. He was the author of Infinite Jest, and at one time he was a professor at Illinois State University. He gave a commencement address at Kenyon College back in 2005, and he opened it with the following story. There are these two young fish swimming in the water, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? So the two young fish swim on for a bit, and eventually one of them turns to the other and goes, what the hell is water? <laughs> Foster Wallace said that the immediate point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important, and ubiquitous realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. And in our current society, there is perhaps no reality that's discussed more often than mental illnesses and paradoxically one of the least understood. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how language affects our understanding of mental illnesses. Because in the discussion about what's the nature of a mental illness, how do we treat it, we often forget what exactly are we supposed to be talking about and how are we talking about it. And how does language affect the way that we perceive someone with mental illness or how a person with a mental illness perceives themselves? So this is based in the linguistic relativity hypothesis, our understanding of languages currently. And the linguistic relativity hypothesis essentially states that one's culture and one's language influences the way in which they perceive the world. It was the basis of the movie Arrival, if you've ever seen that. Um, it was also, it's also currently the favorite theory for understanding the link between, the lang between languages and the mind. And uh, it's important because it allows us to try to understand how exactly human understanding of different societal norms, issues, and ideas has evolved through the, through the eons. Uh, one example of this is the English that I'm using to speak to you now is very different from that what was spoken in the 13th, between the 13th and the 18th centuries. Um, mainly because they had an informal form of address. The, T-H-E-E, -E, was the informal form of address, while you was reserved for polite formal forms of address. Nowadays, we don't make a distinguishing, uh, we don't distinguish between those two ideas. We don't say, you know, the for informal or you for formal. We just say you. So now that we have an understanding of what linguistic relativity is, let's shift to mental illnesses. So first of all, what exactly is a mental illness? Well, according to the American Psychological Association, a mental illness is a health condition that can cause changes in emotion, thinking, and behavior, and it can also result in distress or problems in one's social, family, or work activities. Well, there's a problem with this definition because neurological disorders can cause the same thing. So what distinguishes a neurological disorder from a mental illness? And what types of mental illnesses exist? Now, normally when I ask that second question, people tell me depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, multiple personality disorder, although now that's called dissociative identity disorder. So what's the distinguishing factor between those series of mental illnesses and neurological disorders? So one of the main factors is that uh, neurological disorders, they actually result in large-scale structural changes in the brain, and often those are degenerative, damaging changes. Like you can see here, the Alzheimer's brain has suffered a lot of uh, brain shrinkage, uh, destruction of brain tissue, versus the healthy brain. Depression, schizophrenia, and other mental illnesses, for the most part, don't result in these large-scale structural changes. So that's one distinguishing factor. Another is that in the literature, there's this debate going on on how biological is a mental illness. And it's because uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that, bio, uh, that mental illnesses are not really that biological. They're uh, biologically linked because there are certain genes that predispose people to mental illnesses, but that doesn't mean they get them or if they don't have those genetic variations that they're unlikely to get a mental illness. So, okay, well, mental illnesses are not as biologically based as we originally thought, but then when we talk about them, how else do we perceive them? Normally through stereotypes. So before we jump into the discussion of stereotypes, let's lay down a few important stats. Uh, in, the, in America, the number of U.S. adults who will experience a mental illness during their lifetime is one in four, according to the CDC. And according to the American Academy of Family Physicians, the number of people who will experience depression is 1 in 12. So if so many people experience it, right, then there really shouldn't be so much stigma that we're, we're seeing happen. But I'm sure you all know, stigma against mental illnesses are still very, very high in society. 
So what types of stereotypes exist? This list is a list of five that comes from uh, the Centennial Mental Health Center in Colorado. And they describe a series of mental illness stereotypes and what is the difference between the perception and reality. So mental illness is a character flaw and if you need help for it, you're weak. Well, no, not really. Mental illness is a health condition. You're not weak if you need stitches after getting cut. You're just being, you know, a, a normal human being. Men people with mental illnesses are violent. This is also not true. There was a survey done, uh, it was the National Research Survey on Alcoholism and Other Related Conditions that showed that people with mental illnesses are, uh, on only about 3% of them go on to commit violent crimes or are violent. About 97% of them are not. People with mental illnesses are incompetent. This is also not true. If one twelfth of the American workforce who say, say they have depression was incompetent, well, we'd be in a very different position from where we are today. And since that's not the case, we can see that incompetence really isn't a factor here right now. People with mental illnesses ha have disruptive behavior. They go out of their way to disrupt the behavior of others. And this is also not true. Just because you have a mental illness doesn't mean you're seeking or intentionally or unintentionally to disrupt the behavior of others. And most people are not. And then there's the idea that people with mental illnesses can't contribute anything to society, that they're useless for society. Well, again, you know, if one-fourth of the American workforce just dropped out of the workforce, well, we'd be in dire straits indeed. So we can say that, you know, this isn't really true. But stereotypes are important because they affect and influence our perception of reality. Uh, so, for example, think of somebody with depression. Most people usually think of somebody who is consistently sad, they're not interested in societal activities, maybe they don't have a strong support system. Well, take a look at this tweet that popped up on my Twitter feed back in November of 2018, and you can see that M is describing her brother who, dis who died of mental illness. And she says that uh, my brother died from depression. He also frequently exercised, had supportive friends and family, was successful in school and in work. He had goals that he was constantly reaching. He still killed himself. Now, this is important because it tells us that mental illnesses don't present always in the way that we think they do. So if mental illnesses don't present the way we think they do, if the stereotypes aren't what's happening in reality, if it's not really biologically based, then what, why do we stick to these stereotypes? Why do we hold on to these so strongly? Well, one reason is, is because uh, in the media, in social media, on, in the news, it's often discussed in context of things like uh, gun violence or mass shootings. So just to be clear, I'm not trying to step into the gun debate. That's not the intention of this talk, so please don't take it uh, that way. In fact, the research between the link on gun violence and mental illness is uh, somewhat unclear, although research, recent evidence comes in favor of no link being present. Uh, this is actually a quote from a Fox News article which, in which they uh, looked at the link between gun violence and mental illness and came to the same conclusion that I just told you. This is from Jeffrey Swanson, a professor of psychiatry in Duke, at Duke University, and he says, a mass shooting is so disturbing, so irrational and horrifying. People want to know why it happened, and mental illness is the perfect master explanation. Well, why? Why is mental illness the perfect master explanation? This brings us back to that point of incompetence. When somebody's incompetent, we believe they're not responsible for their actions. We don't think of them as being responsible for the things that they do. And so if, a mass, if, if somebody who goes on a killing spree or commits a, you know, a mass shooting, if we label them as incompetent, label them as mentally ill, we can remove them from their actions. It allows us the peace and security of mind of knowing that, okay, maybe it's just because they're mentally ill. But that's a disservice to people who are actually mentally ill because that renders them as incompetent as well in the way that we perceive them. So back to David Foster Wallace. In 2005, as he ended his spe commencement speech, he said, this is water, this is water. As a way of reminding his uh, the gathered students there that when you suffer from uh, not paying attention to the realities of life, you can often miss out on what is really important to you. And in 2008, David Foster Wallace committed suicide after years of struggling with depression. So the next time someone says to you, you're insane, or you say it to somebody else, I just want you to take a moment, think about what those words do to you and how they influence your thoughts. 
and recognize that it's often a disservice to ourselves and to others to treat everyone as less than a competent, thinking human being. Thank you.